a few weeks ago, I had to travel into New York City uh, for a business meeting, which is always one of my favorite things to do. That's a little bit of sarcasm there. I'm not a big fan of uh, going to New York City, but I had to do it. So I went down uh, to Union Station in New Haven. I took the train in to the Moynihan train station in New York City and I walked up. And it was a beautiful day in New York. So I thought, yeah, it's a 10 minute walk uh, to the building. I'll just go ahead and walk through the city. And it's, you know, wonderful. You kind of take in all the sights, see all the people. And I was headed down one of the sidewalks uh, that day. And from a distance, I saw this man kind of approaching my way. And I'll just describe him as a big, uh, scary looking dude who did not look happy. Beard, tattoos coming my way. And as I got closer to him, I saw his t shirt. And here's what his t shirt said it said, I don't trust, forgive, or forget. I'm like, okay. So I decided to walk on the other side of the street. <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, I'm like, yeah, that's, that's a pretty outrageous thing uh, to put on a shirt, but you know what? That might not be too shocking in our society today. You know, as you look around you, that really, in many ways, is the way our society operates. We don't forgive, we don't forget. You wrong me, I'm going to make you pay. You notice, it. just take a quick glance at some of the headlines. What, how do we treat people who oppose us? Love this language. We rip them. We slam them. We blast our opponents. You go into the town greens all across America, it's very common two groups of people shouting, screaming at each other. You know, should we even talk about social media? The seemingly never-ending tweets, posts, TikToks being posted of people going back and forth, attacking each other, trying to tear each other apart. In many ways, we are a society that is filled with hate. And what I want us to consider this morning is what our response should be as Christians to those we consider to be our enemies. And I want you to do me a favor right now. I want you right now to think of somebody in your life that you would consider to be an enemy, somebody that you may be at odds with right now. And I want us to go to God's word here in Luke chapter 6 and hear these words from our Savior. This is Luke chapter 6. I'm going to begin reading in verse 27. Jesus says, I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Again, as we seek to consider our response this morning to enemies, I want to do it really in three main parts. I want us to consider, first, the reality of enemies. Secondly, our response to enemies. And then thirdly, the reason to love our enemies. First, the reality of enemies. One of my favorite music groups is a band called the Ava Brothers. I have all their albums. I'm a big fan. I've seen them live in concert uh, six times. And years ago, they wrote this wonderful, wonderful song called No Hard Feelings. And it's been pretty routine now. At the end of every concert for the past several years that they play this last song, uh, this is their last song in their concert, this song called No Hard Feelings. 
And at the very end of the song, they repeat the same line four times. And those words are, I have no enemies. And the crowd all joins them and sings along in those four lines. And then the lights come up, the band leaves the stage, and I'm left there like, does everybody really believe that? Do we really believe I have no enemies? Well, Jesus here, and again, I appreciate the sentiment in the song, right? The sentiment of the song is don't harbor hate in your heart. We should be extending forgiveness. That's a great message. Love that. But we have enemies. Jesus here says that we have enemies. And when you think about enemies, you might naturally think of, oh, yes, that person on the opposite side of the political spectrum is me. That's my enemy. Or maybe you think about somebody in that country overseas. Yes, that is my enemy. Maybe if you're a Yankees fan, you think about the Red Sox fans as your enemy, whatever that might be. And again, there are a multitude of ways that people can be opposed to one another. I'm not diminishing some of those aspects. And what we'll learn this morning will certainly apply in those areas. But what we first need to see here is that the primary conflict that is in view when Jesus is talking about loving our enemies is the war between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. Just a few ver verses prior, in verse 22, he said, Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, or when revile you, and spurn your name as evil, here it is, on account of the Son of Man. So the opposition that Jesus is speaking of here is the opposition that comes from being a follower of Christ. And why? Why would people be opposed to us? Why do we have enemies as followers of Christ? Well, in John 15, Jesus said, here's why. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. So as followers of Christ, we will have enemies. And there are two important things we need to see here in application. One, we need to have an expectation of opposition. We saw this when we were going through 1 John. In 1 John 3, the Apostle John said, Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Indeed, as Paul told Timothy, it's inevitable. All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So any notion of going through this life without opposition, without enemies, needs to be removed. We are going to face opposition. But secondly, and this is extremely important, we need to guard our hearts from any temptation to be accepted by the world. Any sort of mindset or temptation of maybe the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan can find some middle ground and get along. The Apostle James said that that is a temptation to spiritual adultery. He said, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. I recently had to drop my oldest daughter off at college. I'm still recovering. I don't want to talk about it. But when I dropped her off, there were a number of students on campus doing something called rushing. Anybody know what that means? Okay, a few of you. Maybe you thought, no, it's not kids hurrying to class or playing football or anything like that. There's this thing called Rush Week, where the students are evaluating, and really, they're evaluating the fraternities, the sororities on campus, and the fraternities and sororities are evaluating them. And there's this week-long process where they're doing all these things and wearing all these crazy things, and it's, I won't get into some of the details of some of the things that they have to do, but the whole point is they want to be accepted by this fraternity or sorority that they want to get into. And I read one example of a guy who apparently, this was just earlier this week, I was reading this, where one of the things he had to do to get in was the guys took him in, into a room, they blew, uh, were blowing freezing cold air on him, and he had to drink five gallons of water without stopping, and at no point could he go use the bathroom. That's what they did to get into this fraternity. I won't tell you what happened and how that played out for that young man, but either way, the point is, here's the, the concept. If you want to be accepted, you have to give in. You have to do things maybe that you wouldn't normally do. And the message, the lesson for us here today is the only way for us to be accepted by the world is to give in, is to take that switch and dim the light that we're supposed to be shining into the darkness. And Jesus warns about this in one verse prior to the section we read today. He says, Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. See, the false prophets 
wouldn't proclaim the truth, wouldn't proclaim God's word because the people were saying, no, 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 speak to us smooth things. Don't speak of sin. Don't speak of judgment. Speak about things that we want to hear. And the false prophets, prophets did that. And Jesus said, woe, woe when all people speak well of you. We shouldn't have an expectation that we can somehow get to a place where the world, the kingdom of Satan, speaks well of us. We will have enemies. If you are going to follow Christ, be faithful to Christ, you will have enemies. And the text here says that they're going to want to destroy you. Okay. Whew. All right. We have enemies. Jesus, you're our king. You're the commander of this army. What's our plan? What's our strategy, our plan of attack? Should we blast them? Love your enemies. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You, you know, I don't think you understand. Do you hear what they're saying to us? Do you see what they're doing to us? They're trying to kill us. What are we going to do? Love your enemies. I want us to consider here the response Jesus is calling us to, to this opposition, this very real enemy that we face. Jesus says, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. I want to understand this love for our enemies that Jesus is calling us to. First, I want us to see this love is a love that is active. Did you notice all that language? Do good. Bless. Pray for. In verse 30, we see give. Verse 31, the golden rule. You should be very familiar with it. As you wish others would do to you, do so to them. It is an active love. It's not simply refraining from harming them. No, it is rather in our deeds, our words, the innermost desires of our heart, we want what's best for our enemy. We seek their good. If they're hungry, we feed them. If they're thirsty, we give them something to drink. When we see them fall, we don't rejoice. We're not glad when we see them stumble. It's a love that always seeks their best interest. So Christ here is calling us in relationship with our enemies to be active in well-doing. Meet their needs. Speak words of life and love to them. Even intercede on their behalf. But it's not just a love that is active. It's a love that is not reactive. And by reactive here, I mean vengeful. Hear Christ's words. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. For one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. One who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. So we're called to an active love in doing good to them, but also a love that is not reactive or vengeful, a love that doesn't strike back, a love that doesn't seek revenge. A love that repays no one evil for evil. Paul told, told the church in Rome, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Now maybe you're sitting there and here's your reaction. Wait a minute. Are you telling me I'm just supposed to be a doormat? I'm just supposed to let people walk all over me? Let people take advantage of me? Don't I have a right to defend myself? Don't I have a right to my property? No. Scripture certainly teaches that we have a right to protect ourselves, a right to protect our loved ones, and we have a right to personal property. So is Jesus contradicting that here? What does he, what does he mean by this? Well, what Jesus is teaching here is that there will be times when instead of insisting on our rights, we relinquish them and submit meekly to injustice out of love for Christ, out of love for our enemy, and for the sake of the kingdom of God. I'll give you a clear example of this. Church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you have two brothers in the church, they're fighting against each other, they sue each other, they take it to an outside court, outside of the church, and what does Paul say to them? They're bringing shame on themselves, bringing shame on the church, and Paul says, why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded for the sake of the kingdom of God? Put it another way, why not bear the cost on your end? And that is the love that Christ is calling us to here. A sacrificial love that does not demand retribution, but instead forgives. So we see a love that is active, a love that is not reactive or vengeful, a love that forgives. And there was an absolutely 
beautiful picture of this in our world. This is rare in our society today, but I want to share that with you uh, this morning. A few weeks ago, uh, the Little League World Series was going on. And there was a game between Texas East and Oklahoma. And Oklahoma was down one run, had two men on base, had two outs, and Isaiah Jarvis stepped up to the plate. Unfortunately, quickly got two strikes on him. So here we go, one more strike, he's out. That pitcher wound up, let the fastball loose, and unfortunately, it went off target and nailed Isaiah Jarvis right in the head. Kid's helmet flew off, fell to the ground. He had coaches, medical professionals running out to the field, gathering around him. And he laid there for several minutes as they cared for this little boy. After a few minutes, he was able to get to his feet, walk to first base, and as he's standing there on first base, he's noticing that the pitcher is visibly upset. And the pitcher is actually starting to break down and starting to cry. And so Isaiah Jarvis stepped off the bag, walked up to the pitcher, and wrapped his arms around him. And he spoke in his ear and he said, hey, it's okay. You're pitching really great. Keep going. A few days later, obviously this got the world's attention, got the media's attention, and Isaiah Jarvis started getting a lot of TV interviews. I'm not sure how old this kid, maybe 11, maybe 11 or 12 years old. And they asked him, why did you do that? And Isaiah said, I wanted to show him the love of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, that is exactly what we are being called to here when we come into contact with those who oppose us and with our enemies. It is a love that does not demand payment for a wrong suffered. It is a love that releases the debt. It is a love, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, takes us along the way of the cross and into fellowship with the crucified. Because Christ was the one who didn't stand on his rights, but bore all the cost on his end and forgave the debt that we owed. So my question for you this morning is this. Who do you need to go wrap your arms around? Who have you been demanding payment from for the way that they have wronged you that you need to go set free? Christ calls us to love our enemies. So we've seen the reality of enemies. We've seen the response we are to have to enemies. But now I want us to consider the reason to love our enemies. We see this in verses 35 through 36. Christ says, love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Jesus says there is great reward in loving your enemies. And how how can we consider, how should we understand this great reward? I'll describe it to you this way. It is sonship in all of its fullness. Sonship is ours now, but we know it will be fully realized. All the benefits of being a child, a son of God, will be fully realized in heaven. And I want to be clear, Jesus is not saying here that if you love your enemies, you will become sons of God. No. Rather, he's saying that loving your enemies is truly being a son of God. It is living out your sonship. It is, as John Calvin said, it is a mark of your adoption. So because our Heavenly Father is kind and merciful to his enemies, when we love our enemies, we're being like him. How do we see this kindness, this mercy, from our Heavenly Father to those who are opposed to him? Well, I'm going to go at that in two aspects. Number one, we see it in his common grace. Right? It says, The Most High is kind to the ungrateful and to the evil. In the parallel passage in Matthew 5, it says that God causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So you got two farmers side by side with their fields. The one honors God, loves God, obeys God. The other dishonors God, hates God, disobeys God, and the sun shines on them both. The rain waters both of their crops. God has every right to exclude his enemy from good. But instead, what does he do? He provides for them. He gives good things to them. And here's the key. He knows. He does all this knowing they will return that good with evil. This is, hopefully you can feel this, in direct contrast to the way that our world operates today. The way the world operates in general. The world always wants to know what's in it for me. What do I get out of it? 
You ever notice how so many times when there is a good cause or a charity and they ask people for donations, how often is it that they include on that? And if you do, you'll be able to enter a raffle to win a great prize. We got to have, our world wants that. And I got to know, what am I going to get out of this if I give? And what Jesus is teaching us here in this text for his followers is, is that if you love or give to get, the ROI is zero. Did you see that in the text? There is no return on that investment. Look at verses 32 to 34. He said, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? Even the world works that way. Sinners do the same thing. If you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit? And actually, it's the exact same word in the Greek. What benefit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. The point is, if we, again, love to be loved in return, or we give to receive back, we're operating just like the rest of the world. But if we love and do good to our enemy, expecting nothing in return, and knowing often it will be responded to with more evil, now you're being like your father. And Jesus says, in that there is great reward. So we see it in his common grace, but also... We see this in our Heavenly Father in his saving grace. Now, this part's going to be hard to hear. I'm going to warn you in advance. But we need to hear it because this will be the key to loving your enemies. You were not worth dying for. I was not worth dying for. What do I mean by that? There was absolutely nothing in us that moved God to send his son to die on that cross for us. There was absolutely nothing that was lovely in us or desirable in us that compelled God to save us. Rather, his word tells us that we were children of wrath just like the rest of mankind. We were following Satan. We were following the course of this world. We were hostile to God. We were his enemies. And yet in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, it says that God showed his love for us and that while we were still sinners, while we were his enemies, Christ died for us. This is agape love. This is divine love. It is love of the unworthy, a love that is not drawn out in any way by merit in the beloved. And for some reason, which I will never understand, maybe you won't understand either, while we were his enemies, He chose to set his love on us. He chose to rescue us out of that kingdom of Satan. He chose to lay down his life for us, bring us into his kingdom, make us sons and daughters, give us a seat at his table, and then lavish on us all the riches of his grace. What amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, would die for me? And the challenge is we can be forgetful. When I was a kid, I've always loved music. Since the earliest memories, I've always loved music. And I've always had this dream growing up of being a singer, being on stage and performing. If you were to know me in high school in my bedroom there, I had a real microphone stand with a real microphone, wasn't plugged into anything, but I would stand in front of the mirror there and I'd have my music playing and ah, I would be in my head just pretending that I was performing for thousands of people. And one night, my friends came over, and my friend had a guitar, and we hooked one of the microphones up to a, to a tape player, and we hit record, and I recorded myself singing. And then the recording ended, and I rewound the tape and hit play, and whew. I was confronted with a harsh reality. I am not a good singer. Well, several years later, I kind of thinking, like, eh, that maybe I'm not that bad and then I found that tape I put it back in and I played it again (sighs) still not no I was reminded man I was really I really am pretty bad there and over the years over the past 25 years of my life I've had to be reminded often many times by my wife and my children uh, that a future in singing is not uh, for me had to be brought back to reality well when our enemies wrong us And our hearts are filled with hate and malice towards them. When we say we'll never forgive, we'll never forget, 
We need to play back the tape. We need to remind ourselves who we were. We need to remind ourselves that it was amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. The reality is the offenses of our enemies don't even come close to the way that we have offended God with our sin. And the power to love our enemies will come when by the work of God's Holy Spirit and his grace, we get that truth out of our heads and into our hearts. That is where we will find strength to love our enemies. And as we do, we will become more and more and more like our Heavenly Father. So we've seen the reality of enemies. We've seen our response that Christ is calling us to to love our enemies. And we've seen the reason to love our enemies, the great reward of being a child of God, being like our Heavenly Father. What I want you to do right now is bring that person back in your mind. Remember that person or groups of people you thought of at the beginning of this service? Bring them back into your mind right now. And I want to acknowledge that I I understand the pain is real. The hurt is real. Many of us have been wronged in very, very serious ways. And loving your enemies, without a doubt, is one of the hardest things that Christ will call you to do as a Christian, as his follower. And in and of ourselves, can't do it. We absolutely need the power of his Holy Spirit. But my encouragement to you this morning is don't let pride get in the way and cause you not to act. Because that will be the barrier of pride. Right? We need to be reminded of God's grace. And I don't know what it is for you, what the right next step is. Maybe it's making a phone call this afternoon. Maybe it's writing a letter. Maybe it's simply going back and getting on your knees and praying for your enemy on their behalf. But remember the love that God has shown in Christ to you when you were his enemy. Let that love fill you and let it flow out towards your enemy. And what you'll see is you will find freedom and you will find blessing from being like your Savior. Let's pray together. Father, may the love that you have shown us in Christ when we were your enemies change us, humble us, and cause us to love our enemies for your glory, for their good, and also for the good of our souls. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.